for our last uh, talk of the day. Um, we have Marjorie Dykeman, who uh, is at University of New York. Yeah. Telling us about. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you very much, much, Stash, for inviting me to this very, very interesting workshop. Part of it I even understand. Uh, yeah, I changed my title a little bit, you see it. It's now Self-Organization and Genomic Causality in Models of Morphogenesis. And I would like to begin with a uh, short view on the long debate about self-organization in embryological development. It goes back actually to antiquity. That's, I think, where I'm supposed to start as a historian of science, uh, in which the idea of a material continuity between generations under the name of pangenesis or preformation uh, was uh, rejected by uh, representatives of the idea of development as a process of increasing complexity from an unorganized egg, which was later called epigenesis. And the prominent representative was here Aristotle. Um, around 1900, uh, with the advent of uh, experimental embryology, and especially with the success of cytology, uh, the experimental, new experimental evidence of the central role of the nucleus, chromosomes, and genes in development was strongly rejected by uh, um, experimental embryologists, in particular those of the Spemann School in Germany, the influential Spemann School in Germany, who perceived uh, development as a more or less organized, self-organized process in the cytoplasm, um, and um, they believed that nuclear genes had nothing to do with it. Uh, in the 21st century, the debate, I mean everything of course in a modified version, uh, continues as gene regulation versus self-organization as causal agents of development. And uh, the um, strongest representative of the first uh, version is Eric Davidson, I think he is uh, <coughs> Uh, according to whom the analysis of complex hierarchical multi-gene developmental gene regulatory networks offers an understanding for the precise spatial and temporal pattern of gene expression of an entire de developmental process. And of course, uh, many people who uh, uh, carry out uh, self models of self-organization uh, think differently uh, like here, a paper in which Amit was involved, uh, namely that embryonic development is a largely self-organizing process. Uh, my goals here are to present some physical, chemical, and genome-based uh, models of morphogenesis to claim uh, the relevance of Sidney Brenner's dictum that biological systems are information processing machines and this must be an essential part of any theory we, we, we may construct. And third, to look at recent approaches that combine self-organization with genomic causality. And of course, many of the lectures today uh, add to uh, what I'm going to look at. I start here with Darcy Thompson's uh, mathematical modeling of organism growth and form. Darcy Thompson has already been mentioned by, by Peter Ball, but I, I, I just stress a few uh, other aspects of it. And um, to start with, Thompson, like before him Gregor Mendel, whose actually tw uh, 200th anniversary we are celebrating this year, perceived mathematics not only as a tool of representation and explanation, but as an expression of biological reality. In his work, he often cites Galilei, uh, uh, whose famous dictum is, of course, nature is a book written in the language of mathematics, which Thomson transformed into a book, is, uh, a book, the book of nature is written in the characters of ge geometry, of course, form. Uh, his famous book was published in 1917 on growth and form, and it was reprinted very, very often afterwards and is reprinted even today. And his aims, uh, his stated aims, are to correlate with mathematical statement and physical law certain phenomena of growth and form, 
and to find unifying principles in life forms through a morphological approach, simple mathematics, and a deep knowledge of Greek philosophy. Thompson was a biologist and also a classicist. And this is, uh, I mean, the book is really fantastic reading and um, one can enjoy these things. According to him, organic form is predetermined by the physical organization of the system in which it developed, and it is basically nothing but a force diagram. And this uh, leads uh, him to uh, uh, formulate his law of transformation of uh, uh, forms of related species through simple equations, like this fish over there. And apart from Galilei, Thompson also related to Goethe's idealistic morphology, Plato's primacy of form over matter, Kant's famous dictum that the criterion of uh, true science lies in its relationship to mathematics. But he also emphasized the importance of uh, the then famous or then fashionable uh, um, um, osmotic models of, of morphogenesis, for example, Stéphane de Duc's claims of 1912, of having created artificial life through osmotic growth, growth processes. And his book, uh, La Biologie Synthétique, contains indeed fantastic pictures of his uh, osmotic life, so-called life uh, creatures. And uh, Le Duc was a physical chemist, and he disregarded already confirmed biological concepts, for example, cell theory, the individuality of chromosomes, the specificity of enzyme reactions, and so on. And so it did really not stimulate um, much of uh, experimental biological research, neither in synthetic biology nor in uh, embryology. And this is uh, highlighted by comments by biologists, which I think are also interesting to read today. The first is by Jacques Loeb, an experimental biologist, according to whom the artificial creation of life is not only a physical process, but has to involve the synthesis of specific molecules, in particular self-replicating DNA, which at that time was nuclein. Or embryologist Hans Driesch, who um, wrote, these patterns and shapes lack the reproducible specificity of organic forms and the capacity to self-regulate. And so he dismissed them as biologically relevant. Also, Thompson rejected some well-established biological principles, such as the chromosome theory as a materialistic theory, or, as we heard already before, Darwin's idea of gradual evolution through natural selection, which contradicted, according to him, the platonic idea of pure form. And uh, so this much, and it is not possible to, to uh, talk about it, uh, uh, shortly about uh, the reception of Thompson's book. Um, it was, on the one hand, very well received, and it is even today, but not so much because it stimulated biological research, or especially experimental biological research, but because of the breadth of scope and the, the, the wonderful prose he, he presented. So like Peter Medawa, who was a staunch uh, Popperian, and uh, of course there is nothing Popperian in, in Thompson's work, he praised it very much. So did James Briscoe, um, who or, uh, but who, who also wrote that the notion that physical laws constrain biological systems has far-reaching consequences. And um, uh, what I really appreciate with this book is that it pointed to the insufficiency of neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory and as such inspiring Stephen Jay Gould's criticism of gradualism and adaptationism. Um, and generally it inspired mathematicians and, uh, and theoretical biologists to mathematically simulate pattern formation and one of them is Turing as we already heard. And I want still to, to mention Briscoe's comment in his praising article about Thompson. He wrote, mathematical constructions do not in themselves provide a causal explanation for biological forms. This requires molecular, genetic, and mechani or mechanical insight into the processes. So I'm coming now to uh, Turing, and I will of course not say anything more about uh, his paper. Just um, to, uh, yeah, to go to the uh, last part of the introduction in which uh, he, he wrote that um, the, uh, his theory suggests 
that certain well-known physical laws are sufficient to account for many of the facts of, of morphogenesis. And this is really very, very close to Thomson. I think that it can be seen very, very closely. And um, Peter Saunders, one of the uh, bi biographers of, of uh, Turing, however, pointed out that the, the term morphogenesis is not correct. Turing does not really deal with form production, but he deals with pattern formation. So he suggested he should have taken a different word. So this is the paper. I don't say anything about it. Um, the, shortly to the background, I don't remember to have heard about that uh, today. Uh, this was, of course, the, um, his work on the design of thinking machines, which raised his curiosity of the design of the brain of brain development. But because he thought the uh, brain development is too complicated, he turned to uh, um, embryological growth, which he thought was simpler. I'm not sure if embryologists will agree, but uh, that was the, the background. And he, as we already heard, approached the task mostly on his own and did not seek the advice of biologists. And so his mathematical model of the growing embryo was indeed simple and elegant. It considered the embryo as a state function and eliminated growth despite what he wanted to show, namely the growing embryo. But it was simple and elegant. Uh, the biology of Turing's paper was really outdated. Um, it's not important for the mathematics, but uh, for me as a biology historian, it is really striking to see this. For example, the gene concept was unclear, and the gene as enzymes concept was long outdated at the time of, of the paper. So for him, the genes may be considered as morphogens or more, radical, more uh, accurately as radicals of the giant molecules known as chromosomes. But basically, the function of genes is presumed to be purely catalytic. They catalyze the production of other morphogenes, which in turn may only be catalysts. And I was reminded here of um, Francis Crick, who in a completely different context, uh, five years later, uh, talked about this, um, the logical impossibility of, um, or the logical fa fallacy of, of thinking of uh, proteins, um, the synthesis of proteins only by other proteins, namely enzymes. He said that it, it will lead to an endless regress and we don't come anywhere from there. Okay, this, no, just this. So, um, according to historian of science, uh, Evelyn Fox Keller, Turing was more interested in mathematical fruitfulness and accessibility than in the correspondence of his hypothetical reactions to real reactions in the cell. And this was one of the reasons why the biologists did not respond for many, many, for two decades at least, but mainly for four decades, did not respond so positively, because they were not interested in whether the interactions could create uh, patterns in this way, but whether they really do. And there was no confirmation to that. And uh, I, I said yesterday already that Waddington, uh, uh, who was one of the few who were interested, um, made the uh, um, remark, uh, published it also, that the model does not apply to morphogenesis, rather to spots and stripes, that is pattern formation, and that really did not raise the appreciation for the, uh, the paper among biologists. They wanted really to know, to, uh, to deal with morphogenesis with development. Yeah, you heard several times already that in the 1970s the situation changed, uh, updated versions and also other models uh, were used to simulate pattern formation in hydra, in seashells, uh, drosophila and others. And uh, we have here also the famous Gira and Meinert uh, uh, works, uh, which they um, based not on Turing but on Matuyana, uh, but later they in included Turing. The problem was indeed that these simulations often did not reflect realities. And this was uh, also in Tübingen, in where Gira and Meinert uh, worked, was uh, perceived uh, by uh, Christiane nüstein Vollhardt, uh, who uh, was at first very intrigued by Meinert's models, and, but later, after she started to study developmental uh, genetics in, in Basel with uh, Walter Gehring, um, she, she realized that the, the uh, patterns on, in Drosophila did, were not created in a Turing-like way. And she wrote, 
that pattern formation results from a cascade of gene expression starting with a, a specific distribution of messenger RNA in the egg and not from reaction diffusion. And similarly, uh, Michael Acom's uh, famous paper um, of 1989 made it clear that elegant mechanisms of model builders like Meinhardt do not generate the periodicity in the repeated stripes, repeating stripes in Prosophila development. One of the strongest critics of the simulation models, uh, not especially Turing, but just simulation models, was Eric Davidson, not surprisingly. Uh, according to whom one of the worst fallacies in the field of modeling in biology is the assumption that you, if you can make a model which simulates the process, then the model must represent how it works. According to him, the only way is experimental perturbation guided by hypothesis and modeling thereafter. Uh, just a very few words on Eric Davidson's almost complete model of a complex developmental gene regulatory network. Um, this network comprised interaction between regulatory genes and their products during early development of uh, sea urchins. It was the result, and this is uh, the unique part of it, I mean, I think nobody else did it to such an extent as Eric did. It was the result of decades-long experimental research in which the cell type specific gene expression patterns were systematically examined. This is a, a chart of, of uh, at one stage of an endomesoderm uh, network. You have up there the maternal inputs and then uh, several levels of regulatory genes. And at the lower level, the effector genes, which just code for proteins. Uh, Davidson and colleagues converted later the um, GRN system into a Boolean model that contained 50 regulatory genes. And the result was that this uh, GRN was almost complete and predictive. So his philosoph the philosophy behind the model, as I see it, is that it was first, as I stated before, uh, based on an experimental analysis of mechanisms and causes. It was not just a, a mathematical simulation of phenomenological features. And uh, second, that the model underlines the fundamental importance of three basic biological concepts informational hierarchy, genomic causality, which does not mean a one-to-one -one relationship of gene and, and traits, but of course the, the genome as a, um, uh, as a scope in which traits can uh, develop, and uh, third, biological specificity. James Briscoe uh, wrote about Davidson's model uh, uh, some years ago, uh, that the power of experimental data with computation simulation is evident. The work illustrates the potential of the, net, uh, the approach to provide a mechanistic and causal explanation to a complex set of gene regulatory events controlling development of cell fate uh, specification. Uh, Briscoe also pointed, pointed out some of the limitations of the, of, uh, the, the network approach of Davidson which became uh, known later, or was looked at later. For example, uh, the downplaying of, of um, the dynamics of the network and also the uh, lack of quantification. But uh, he, th uh, he thinks this uh, can be uh, amended. And he himself now uh, links the dynamics of the gene network approach to a dynamical systems approach in order to, uh, to uh, explore how the logic of developmental decisions are implemented by the underlying molecular mechanisms. And he is now dealing with, uh, uh, um, uh, with the frame of Renitom's um, catastrophe uh, theory. But I'm not talking about that. So my last point is the combination of physical chemical mechanisms and genome-based mechanisms in the generation of periodic patterns in animals. So I, I briefly talk about two papers which have already been mentioned before and asked some questions about them. The first is the paper by Raspopovich and colleagues in uh, 2014. It's one of the many papers who are dealing with digit patterning um, in a, 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 a Turing network modulated by morphogen gradients. And this Turing network is um, composed of, of uh, 
BMP is the morphotene, SOX9 is a transcription factor, and the WRT, the heute already conserved genes. That means he has gene products here, and, and then the, um, the um, uh, mathematical uh, Turing models. And we see, you can see that the re, um, results of the models, and on the right side of in the organism, they uh, are quite impressively um, um, agreeing with each, each other. And um, the problem still is, uh, despite the fact that they combine experimental, uh, an, an experimental approach with the modeling, the problem is that some basic assumptions, assumptions are not yet empirically verified. For example, the equations which contain SOX3 with an exponent of 3, uh, which is necessary to uh, generate uh, spatial patterns, are not, um, more like, uh, are not um, uh, experimentally verified at all. Uh, its molecular basis is, is completely unclear. It is just uh, used because otherwise you cannot create. He could not, they could not create uh, spatial patterns. This is one thing. And then another, uh, my questions here are, it's not only to this model, but to many others. How does this model account for the species, species specificity of the patterns? Patterns, yes, the five digits are, uh, with mammals, very widespread. But they are still different from each species and even each, in, each individual. And how does this model account for this? And the second question is, how does this model account for their stability for geological times? Some species, uh, I mean, mammals, I don't really know how long they exi have existed, but at least for a long period of time. And how is it that the uh, same kind of pattern uh, arises again and again and again over generations? The second paper I want to deal with is by Andrew A. Economy, uh, two years ago, um, who um, con conducted a perturbation analysis of a Turing-like reaction diffusion stride patterning system in the um, mammalian palate. I think both of them uh, worked with mice. They're not entirely yep. sure. So, uh, also they showed here the cooperation of many factors like growth factor ligand proteins and genes uh, in this patterning and pointed to the utility of a perturbation analysis for constraining uh, the reaction diffusion uh, systems. And what I understood is that uh, you can uh, with a, create many, many different uh, reaction diffusion systems, but uh, in order to find out which are uh, uh, really used in the organism, you have to conduct this perturbation analysis to, to cut down on them. Yeah, and they aim at experimentally tractable ex descriptions so that empirical data and theory can be compared. What I found, as a historian, most interesting are, uh, is that he, or this group, uh, uh, raised some open biological questions. Why do they ask, for example, does the patterning of the palate use five uh, pathways, when in principle two would do? They list some possible answers, for example, uh, robustness or this pathway provides additional tunings of the pattern. And then they, uh, as a last point, they <laughs> raise the possibility that the apparent overkill in terms of numbers of pathways involved is merely because there is no evolutionary pressure to eliminate or suppress their role in the palate. And this points to evolution, which I find very, very interesting. Um, and evolution is uh, one of the reasons that some things which could be done much simpler and cleaner uh, appear messy in the, in the organisms. And, uh, and this has been um, also seen by uh, Francis Crick, for example, when he tried to solve the, the genetic code and found out it's simply not not as clean, elegant uh, way uh, the, the code is, is uh, constructed. And, and he uh, is then warned and it said, simplicity and elegance is a dangerous guide for biologists. And it's not always true, but sometimes it is. And um, Sean Vitadello and uh, his group, they published a paper at, uh, last year on Turing pattern design principles and robustness. They point to the same problem, uh, namely they contrast the, contrast the beauty of mathem mathematical models and the ugly truth of reality. 
and they suggest to confront this problem, uh, uh, um, that the, to confront this problem, the extent to which the assumptions underlying our models are robust and in line with what we see in nature is essential. So my uh, conclusion is that, as I see it, until now, mathematical models of self-organization alone seemingly are unable to account for robust morphogenesis, not pattern formation, but morphogenesis, and long-standing developmental and species stability. Now models of self-organization are combined with those of developmental genomic regulation. And um, I think we have to wait to see. And I want to cite at the end, um, the quote at the end, François Jacob, who uh, in his book, The Logic of Life, um, uh, stated that um, the modern vision of development combines preformation, um, which he perceives as genetic program, and epigenesis. And if we just transform this sentence, we can, I ask in the end, can we say now that from self-organization versus genomic causality, we can say self-organization in the frame of genomic causality. This is a um, question that philosophers and historians sure cannot answer. I thank you very much for your attention. Many of us knew both Davidson and uh, Meinhardt, and uh, both of them were not the easiest people to argue with, because they thought they have, um, by the time that you engage them, have already figured out all the questions, uh, all the answers. And I think one of the difficulties has to do with the fact that humans, and maybe some humans more than others, have a tendency to overstate the generality of their results. And I think that the impatience really limits, so, 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 so th this is just a human trait, because we fall in love with our uh, theories and models like, like Pygmalion. But I think uh, there is also, a, a point should be made in favor of Davidson, is that it, there is a point in analyzing your systems, whatever it is, it can be a system of equations or it can be search in, in great detail so that you are absolutely sure or to the extent that you can be sure that what you think is happening is actually happening in your system. And in my mind, there is no difference in doing this for a system of equations and for, for an experimental system. You, you really need to understand what is happening in the object that you are studying in great detail and not just by feeling it uh, in, in, in the dark room. And I think this detailed analysis somehow disappears from the way <laughs> in which modern science is conducted in spite of all the great tools. And this contributes to, or, or this makes the sociological boundaries that we have between mathematicians and uh, empiricists even more um, kind of abrasive. So that, that, that's, that's really more of a comment than yeah, I, I don't have to answer, but I want to say that I do agree, and I had many conversations also of, uh, with people who, who knew Eric Davidson well, who said that his work that he did in great detail, I mean the experimental uh, exploration was really a decades long work, that, that is not done today, and people don't do that anymore. They rather prefer modeling, it goes quick, I mean, most of my and, and yeah. I mean, but, but, but even there, you said, yeah. uh, also there, the detailed analysis are often yeah. missing. Yeah, so I, I, I take it that there, the problem is similar in, in both, uh, both fields. Yes. And, and to the first thing you said, just let me uh, just uh, cite uh, Michael Polanyi, who, who uh, is of the opinion, who was of the opinion, that for a scientist to, to promote something that is new and that's is, is basic, 
um, it is necessary that he or she believes in what, what he is doing for some time. That means there's a certain lack of self-criticism. It should come at some stage, and the colleagues should, of, of, of course, not make the, 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 the mistake of, of following somebody blindly, which often happens also in philosophy. But um, anyhow, but it is necessary to push something forward uh, that you believe in. mathematical models, one might also uh, highlight this uh, clock and wavefront model, so-called, due to Christopher Zeman, who was a René Thome uh, uh, acolyte. And, uh, and that has, probably as Alex Olo will tell us tomorrow, has rather accurately predicted what was then found in semitogenesis and plausibly exists also in short-term insect patterning that Ackham and others have pursued. So that one was rather on target. It was qualitative, but rather on target, in a, in a literal sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, over here. Uh, yeah, thank you for the yeah. for the talk. So just stimulated by what Stas said. I think uh, the question of uh, you were saying nowadays we don't do the details anymore, and I think since it's getting later, <coughs> it's also more philosophical. I think to me, my my question I have is, uh, what do we call a detail, and and what is not a detail, because. Okay, Eric's work, for sure, I mean, extremely detailed and, and very careful. But nowadays, the question is at which level of description should we kind of attack the problem? And so, I think that could be an interesting discussion to hear the views, because to me, uh, that's a key question where I think at which level. Like, should we do what Eric did, now more systematic, or should we find a higher level description that is useful? Um, I would like to add this to the discussion. I mean, I think we all agree that they uh, you cannot forget about them. I think that's what they want to do. The question is, again, I think the decision, decision about the level of description entails that some aspects are details. The physicists might say we can average them out, and that uh, does not matter for the essence of the problem that we are facing. So I agree, we should not forget about them, but it's not to say it's not the same to say we have to study them in all detail. No, no, that is something different. That I don't know. Well, exactly, but I think that's also important to emphasize because uh, we have so many choices nowadays what we want to study at which level. That it's a practical problem in the lab now to decide what we do. Mm -hmm. And I do see an emphasis on the molecular detail. I think because it's easier to tackle these than higher level problems, that's my personal interpretation. And I think it's a valid discussion to at least consider which level is the one that we want to um, address. And, and I there think I think we can learn a lot from <coughs> people from you and also from physicists to have a very systematic approach to coarse graining. And I feel that's what we are, maybe should have more in biology, a coarse graining discussion and, and how to approach that. Physicists are better at that, yes. Well, and, and, no, just to add one, one sentence. Um, I think one of the uh, really um, things Eric did was to, to bring the uh, discussion about development in genetics from one gene analysis to the multiple gene analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, to, to a systems approach. And he did it as soon as it was possible. Yes, absolutely. And but still he, he uh, started with theology. To th thanks very much. I really like that. Um, and I was very glad to see Darcy Thompson talked about some more as well. I guess the comments I had, and it speaks to very much to this point, you ended up by saying rather than um, sort of opposing a gen genomic view to a self organized view, it's not clear to me that anyone has really done that since Darcy Thompson. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the way it's framed now, and I think the combination of the two seems to me to be the, you know, the, what the approach people are taking. The question is what emphasis you put on, on, on different levels, and that, for that reason, the, the fact that you were talking about the context being genomic causation, I think that's where I might question that framing. 
of it because the issue of you know cause, I mean the issue of causation is, is is difficult, right? It's a slippery concept. It's always hard to quantify. But there are ways of doing it, and there are ways that seem to show that if that if you use measures of causal power within these systems, some of those are stronger at the higher levels of organization than at the lower levels. There are ways of quantifying exactly this question, what matters and what doesn't. And particularly for metazoa, it seems that the, 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 the causal power resides more at some of the higher levels. So, and I mean, I think we've seen a good example of that earlier on today, where, you know, the gene that seemed to be crucial to a diffusion gradient, you knock it out completely, and the pattern stays. So, I, 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 I really question the notion that actually the causation ultimately all flows up from the bottom-up uh, level of genes. I don't think that's the case. I think there are now good reasons to think that it's not the case. And that perhaps the better idea is to look for where that causal power resides within the hierarchy of this system, which might help you to determine what really matters in the details and what doesn't. Yep. Thank you. No, no, I, I, want, I want to answer. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> I use the term causation on purpose, and I'm convinced it should be there. And by that, as I said, I don't mean one gene, one, one trait. That, that is long out, and nobody believes that anymore. But on the other hand, without the genomic frame, we wouldn't have the diversity of, of species. And we wouldn't have the diversity of species transmitted for so many generations. And I don't see yet, if you show me, I believe, but if, see that self-organization can provide for that stability over such a long period of time. So that's why I think we have a genomic causality, but in between, I mean, in the, let's say, embryological development, uh, a lot of space for, for other, other developers, for other uh, things. And the gene network is, is a higher level. I mean, and it's, in any case, it's a hierarchical uh, concept. And um, I think it is necessary. I, I, I haven't yet seen anything, anything better than that. Okay. So Sarah, can you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's that talk. Um, so the fact that there are redundant systems doesn't mean that the genes aren't causative. It simply means that there are genes that can substitute for each other to do similar things. So, and, and also, I mean, I showed very clearly, if you knock out one gene, you do disrupt the pattern. Um, it's just that, you know, you, you, you know if you need to, when you knock out multiple ones, you can kind of correct it. But that doesn't in any way you know, negate the fact that the genes are coding for these molecules that allow these processes to happen. Um, so, I mean, I agree with the... <laughs> so, just to continue the same line of thinking, um, you know, many of us work with lab animals and are very comfortable in the lab. In nature, there is a lot of chaos, temperature, you know, food, and other things. So uh, part of the things that we call redundancy can be robustness uh, that you cannot see in lab conditions, uh, and we miss them. So you know, if you push the temperature, if you push you know, starvation, something else, you may find that the patterns do change and do matter. Right? So the pattern can also change by compensation. The network can change. You will not see a phenotype. So, so there are a lot of changes that you can see, not necessarily a gene and morphology or a gene and a pattern, because there are compensation networks. All right, anyone else? Alex. Uh, and Michelle, uh, why do you think biology is so um, focused on just understanding like the logic circuit of how things are connected and this so less emphasis on mechanics because to understand morphogenesis we're talking about how the shape comes into play you have to be in physics and how things are so called assembled so I know the reality is somewhere in between but what do you think the community took <coughs> this role to only focus on a, a logic circuit rather than mechanics 
I am afraid I didn't quite understand what you said. Who is who are the people who uh, went to to physical uh, um, concepts only when the logical circuit was there? Sorry, what? Whom, whom are you referring to? I think he's saying the field, the field. sort of biased towards this regulation at the molecular scale, but there's sort of biophysical events at, at various other life scales in morphogenesis that were less of a priority, is that? Yeah. Like, from a historical perspective, how would you explain that tendency? I, I know rather the other tendency, that, that biologists don't go to the logical process. Well, I think, Alex, the reason is that uh, <laughs> molecular readouts, or the presence or the absence of a protein or a transcript, is much easier to measure than to measure the magnitude of a force. Yeah. And uh, that's, uh, it, it is just a measurement issue. Okay. So if we have the very easy force, I mean, convenient f devices to measure forces and stresses and the mechanical properties, things would be different. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So let's uh, make our way outside now. Uh, we'll be having a poster session. There's, I think, it's on the seventh and eighth, I believe. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.